Let's just look now at lesson four for our cornerstone. Uh, the title for October 27th, Sabbath October 27th, is Good Over Evil. We can summarize this lesson as such. The spiritual war between Christ and Satan is not isolated, some isolated connection between two equal powers in the heavenly realms. First, God is supreme, all-powerful. Satan has already been defeated sentenced, and his end is inevitable. Second, angelic beings created by God are at work with the task of the kingdom of God. Fallen angels who sided with Lucifer are working furiously to inflict damage as their own doom draws near. Clearly, fallen humanity senses that something is going on beyond what the eyes can see. Christians know from scripture that God has claimed victory over sin. But Satan still works to deceive and undermine the plan of salvation by seeking to devour and steal and kill those who would choose to claim their place as heirs of God's kingdom. This battle for souls is so clearly depicted in the story of the demoniac possessed by thousands of demons and banished into Satan's domain. In Mark 5 and Matthew 8, the work of Satan's forces is revealed in the desperate plight of a man who, compelled by what must have been a mustard seed of faith, but more prominently a band of demons, runs at Jesus. The story event is rich with a visceral look at the reality of evil angels and the ultimate victory of Christ's powerful hand of grace. Also emerging from this story is the way God's power goes with us when we testify of his great acts of salvation and his mercy. In fact, this lost and despised young man becomes perhaps the first Christian missionary sent to Decapolis, a region of ten cities bankrupt of true religion. What seems unavoidable is a question in this study. How does God's power over evil get fleshed out through his people in the days in which we are living? So as we go through this lesson, we want you to be aware of the world of evil and angelic forces. We want you to have a sense that the power over death and evil is sure. And we want you to make the choice to align yourself overtly and eternally with God and his kingdom. We're going to be exploring angels, spiritual warfare, and prayer. Let's go to our key text for this week. Our key text is taken from Mark 5 verse 15. And we're looking at the New King James Version of this text. It says, then they came to Jesus and saw the one whom had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Mark 5 verse 15. Our flashlight section says, Were not miracles wrought by Christ and his apostles? The same compassionate Savior lives today. And he is as willing to listen to the prayer of faith as when he walked visibly among men. The natural cooperates with the supernatural. It is a part of God's plan to grant us, in answer to the prayer of faith, that which he would not bestow, did we not thus ask. And this is taken from the Great Controversy, page 525. The... What do you think section now says, do you think that many people today are aware uh, that angels are sent to help, guide, and protect God's children? What evidence do you know of in scripture that conveys the idea that God sends his angels to help us? Now the did you know section of the lesson says the following, Satan is using many avenues to turn our eyes from God's love and truth. It is in TV shows, movies, books, and the media. 
It is important that we guard the avenues to our soul and keep our eyes on Jesus. Seeing Jesus in the scripture brings spiritual vitality to our whole being. In the gospel, Jesus heals the sick, multiplies the bread, raises the dead, forgives sin, delivers demoniacs, and calms storms. He brings healing, happiness, and hope. He overcomes disaster, demons, and death. He defeats sorrow, suffering, and sickness. He triumphs over sin and Satan. And this is taken from Mark Finley's book, Solid Ground, page 23. So we want you to come to church prepared now to discuss uh, stories from the Bible that you are aware of that have the influence of angels, where angels made contact with uh, humans. And, you know, we can discuss some of those. All right. So any stories that you know where angels are used to make contact or to help uh, people. We can also talk about real life experiences. For example, I remember a story being told at a crusade of a pastor who broke down in uh he was heading home car broke down he was in a very uh violent area he had stopped near a street light and uh, you know some guys began walking towards the vehicle he felt very nervous and these guys began saying oh, what the up a man do uh, do sit down in another car so just sit down so 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 and the pastor was all alone but what they had been seeing were the angels that were sent to guard the pastor while he waited for someone to come and help him out. Right. So there are many stories like that that are out there. If you know, then you can bring these stories as well to to share. Now we need to get into the story. But before we need to look at what the story is saying, this story teaches us um, two things. One, God protects us against demons and evil in ways that we are not aware. So sometimes we don't even know what we are being protected from. And our devotion and prayer to God about this unseen world opens our eyes to the possibility of extending the gospel to others when we might be afraid to launch out in faith. So the section now that says into the story, let's dive deeper into it. They went across the Sea of Galilee into the area of the Gerasenes. Uh, Jesus got out of the boat. A man with an evil spirit came up from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs. No one could keep him tied up anymore. Not even a chain could hold him. His hands and feet had been chained, were often chained. Uh, he tore the chains apart. He broke the iron cuffs off his ankles and no one was strong enough to control him. Night and day he screamed among the tombs and in the hills. He cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus a long way off, he ran to him. He fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, Jesus, son of the most high God, what do you want with me? Promise before God that you won't hurt me. This was because Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked the demon, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied. There are many of us. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs were feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, let us go into them. Jesus allowed it. The evil spirits came out of the man and went into the pigs. There were about 2,000 pigs in the herd, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank. They ran into the lake and drowned. Those who were tending the pigs ran off. They told the people in the town and the countryside what had happened. The people went out to see for themselves. Then, they came to Jesus. They saw the man who had been controlled by the many demons. He was there sitting and he was now dressed and thinking clearly. All this made the people afraid. And those who had seen it told them what had happened to the man. They told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to beg Jesus to leave this area. 
Jesus was getting into the boat, and the man who had been controlled by the demons begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him. He said, Go home to your family, tell how much the Lord has done for you, and tell how kind he has been to you. And this is taken from Mark 5, verse 1 to 19. So here are some things to think about now that we have done this a story. As you read the story of the demoniac, what are some of the key sentences or phrases that are central to the story? What are things that kind of stick out in your mind? What do you think this story, or why rather, do you think that this story is included in the Gospels? What purpose does it serve? It says that all scripture is given for instruction, for reproof, and all of that. So why is this one here? Why would the message in this event be important? Okay, so how was the demoniac described? And according to the text, how do the villagers, even the disciples, relate to this man who is known to be demon-possessed? Now, what then is demon possession and how would you describe it? How do you think it happens? Are people who are demon possessed really completely out of control? What are some other examples in scripture that discuss this phenomenon? What is the reaction of the evil angels when Christ is near? Why do you think the people reacted the way they did? Is it because they did not want people disturbing with the forces of good and evil? What was their motivation in asking Jesus to leave the region? Why do you think they, the man who had been freed of the demons did not want to part company with Jesus? Why do you think Jesus gave this man the command to tell others what God had done for him? Why would this task be helpful to the man who had been healed of the evil spirits. What does this story tell us about the nature of evil and its real presence in the human experience? Why do you think the obvious presence of demons seems rarer today than it seemed to be in the times of Christ? So these are questions that you know we can work through and we'll come up with a better appreciation of this story. Let's go to the punchlines now. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is taken, of course, from 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20. It says now, When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept, clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. And this is taken from Matthew 12, verse 43, and 43 to 45. We will talk more about this text when we get to class, but pay attention to, to this one in particular. The next one says, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Romans 7 verse 21 to 23. Next punchline says, I say then, Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Galatians 5 verse 16 and 17. Further insight section says, It is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding 
we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subject upon which it is allowed to dwell. And this is taken from The Great Controversy, written by Ellen White, page 555. And this is very important when we have our discussions about how this lesson is connected to media. So guys, I hope that this little preview will whet your appetite for deeper study and further study. I hope that you will go to the daily section so that when we meet, we'll have a nice rich discussion. God bless and we'll see you in the next episode.